of steels. I mean, uh, uh, traditional steels that uh, we normally we are working on in our research center. And uh, I choose that because of two reasons. The first of one, because it's the, this uh, um, iron-based uh, ODS alloy that I was talking about uh, is not melt. I mean, it's formed by a mechanically alloy process. And then you get a very, um, very, very ultra-fine grain microstructure. So uh, now uh, ultra-fine grain is uh, some topic that is very interesting for the steels makers and for the product because of the good properties uh, that uh, or refinement uh, process is uh, giving a very good properties in some steel products. And uh, all the insights that this alloy have about the recrystallization process, the evolution of the microstructure of very fine grains can be also applied uh, the concepts can be also applied uh, for uh, other kinds of, of steels. That's one reason, and I think that the, even the, the, um, the element or the, the alloy is completely different than a traditional steel. Could be useful for anyone, uh, for everyone, uh, to, to to hear about this material. And the second uh, reason was because I start this uh, as a postdoc in Cambridge with Professor Badisi as supervisor. But uh, when I come back to my my uh, actual research center, uh, oh, is that? Thank you. Um, well, uh, it's not um, the kind of products that we are working there. So the only uh, the only chance that I have to work is in let's say in the free time. So not so many work since I uh, left Cambridge, but I think that uh, we are getting some nice results and I'm, I would like to share with you. Uh, as we were told before, so we are a pretty small group. Most of the people here is working in seed steels, I mean seed products, uh, electrical steels, uh, uh, trip steels, uh, ultra uh, ULC steels, DP steels, binitic steels. No one is working on uh, iron-based ODS alloy, even in any other the product, the, the, um, the steels uh, for uh, power plant uh, applications. Uh, but first of all, I would like to introduce how ODS oxide dispersion strength steels uh, are manufactured, because the manufacturing route can give some clues about the microstructure obtained. So mm, the iron-based ODS alloy, uh, mm, they have the property to combine very uh, interesting uh, properties for uh, power plants. I mean, they are uh, simultaneously offer a very good combination of corrosion resistance because of the aluminum content uh, here, because this aluminum can produce a, a scale of alumina scale on the surface and can prevent the, uh, the, um, the corrosion of the material at high temperatures, and also because of the alumina particles uh, introduced on the uh, on the matrix uh, during the mechanical uh, mechanical alloying process, that also give a very good strength uh, because of the pinning of the particles on this location. So. Uh, these two properties uh, give uh, this uh, kind of materials um, good or exciting uh, uh, um, field uh, to be applied are the uh, heat exchanger tubing for biomass power plants uh, uh, using a combined uh, cycle of gas turbine uh, boilers. Okay. Where is the here? But um, this kind of material can be applied in other fields. I mean, uh, nowadays are, uh, it's a, a pretty fashionable material because uh, they have been chosen for the, inside the ITER project as one of the materials on the outer uh, sealed in the, uh, where the, the plasma is, is taking place. Also here, uh, there is some parts of the aircraft engine who has uh, been made with this kind of material, uh, particularly PM2000, which is a trademark of a, a German manufacturer. Uh, also, you have a very uh, high resistance or high um, strength tools 
to to manufacture uh, with this uh, this material. So there are several applications uh, for this kind of materials, and the more exciting one maybe is also the uh, as biomaterial because this uh, has been discovered recently for other research on thenium that the alumina scale produced in this material uh, have a very nice interaction with the osteoplast. Uh, I mean the, uh, the bone cells that you have in your body. So when uh, normally the, the, um, the biomaterial used uh, uh, nowadays is uh, a core of titanium and then they are coated with hydroxyapatite which is uh, also stimulate the formation of osteoplasts inside. But this material can do that directly without any coating, which makes also a very interesting thing uh, of field of application. Anyway, um, um, for any of the applications that I told you before, the, the manufacturing route is uh, uh, fairly the same. I mean, you have to mix so master alloy that you have oxygen, yttrium oxide is the only way to put yttrium oxide into the, uh, the, 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 uh, the inside the material. Uh, chromium, nickel, or whatever you put here in the mill, and then you are uh, milling for uh, several days at uh, a very high speed uh, until you get uh, nanoparticles of pow or powder nanoparticles, and then you put. Uh, all of this in a hot isostatic uh, pressing, then pushed all together until you get the, uh, the material uh, is actually, the metal is actually formed, and then is finally conformed uh, by extrusion. Then you can hot roll the material if you want, or cold roll, or whatever the application uh, that it could be. So we will uh, finish our processing here. So after extrusion, we will analyze the, uh, the material. So uh, let's focus now with the application of this material as a heat exchanger in the combined cycle gas turbine biomass power plants. So power plant is something that, uh, I mean biomass power plant is something that in Europe is becoming very uh, more important uh, because of the renewable uh, energy thing. And also because it's very, uh, there are a lot of boots, a lot of uh, boots around, uh, uh, garbage too that can be recycling, uh, recycled here, but um, the thing is this kind of, of plants could be more uh, reliable if you, we are able to increase the efficiency from the 35 to the 45 percent. And to do that, we need to work at around uh, 1100 degrees C in uh, the, the heat exchanger, uh, have, uh, our pressurized tube around uh, 1530 bar of pressure. But all of this, I, I, I saw here some of the experimental tubes w uh, really working into the, into the boiler. And you can see, you can figure out here the conditions of the stream conditions that this material have to work. But this atmosphere, because of the, uh, the, the, the biological fuel, are working in a very corrosive atmosphere too. So um, if we want to build something reliable, we have to uh, at least uh, increase the lifetime of these tubes working at at least 10,000 uh, 10, hours of working, at least. Uh, and then uh, since the, this PM uh, or this ODS tubing uh, has uh, known for a long time, but we have to change in some way the processing route of this material in order to, uh, to adapt or to allow working in that conditions. Okay? But it's not only a question of manufacturing one, two, or ten tubes. So here you have a picture of the actual biomass power plant working in Sweden. And here you have a draft of the heat exchanger area. So there is a lot of tubes here, five meters length, uh, that, uh, that you have to manufacture all together in a heat exchanger. So this also become one of the first time that uh, some um, complicated process alloy like uh, this ODS uh, has been, manuf uh, has been uh, uh, manufactured as um, a structural material, I mean for structural applications like this one, okay? So uh, normally, as I told you, these tubes are manufactured by HIP, high hydrostatic pressure, and uh, well, hot, uh, hot extrusion and recrystallization heat treatment. This 
uh, produce very coarse grain. When I told by uh, I meant coarse, I meant uh, several millimeters length grain, grains in, uh, in axial direction, which induce good properties in that direction, but not good in the hoop direction. Which in a pressurized tube, you have to improve uh, if you want to improve the the creep strength. So uh, the poor properties in hoop direction is the problem. So we have to solve that problem uh, in that material. And the way that we figure out, uh, meanwhile we were working in Cambridge uh, to do that, is to change the processing route. So uh, when one way to do that is uh, to extrude the material through a die formed by three uh, cylinders which are rotating freely. And then when you push your material, which is not a very, I mean, it's room or a hundred degree uh, as maximum degree C of temperature, when you push it through the die, then you uh, are uh, um, re, uh, produce an extrusion, but also a torsion of the tube. So then you can perform some kind of helicoidal uh, path during the, uh, the processing. And this helicoidal path can also uh, induce some kind of uh, alignment or the, the particles inside the tubes that produce after recrystallization and kind of helicoidal grain, which is going in that sense, which will be better uh, for hoop stresses than uh, the just axial extrusion uh, or the old one of the extrusion processes. So that's uh, the thing that we did. And also, uh, as I saw here, uh, how is the uh, grain structure for different degrees on reduction of the, of the tubes. You know that this is in the axial direction, you have very coarse grains, but the grains uh, are uh, decreasing uh, or increasing in, uh, in size as long as you are going through the uh, inner part of the tube and you got some degree of deviation from the axial direction if you uh, see the flat uh, section of the tube. But when you increase the deformation to 90% in area reduction, the grains are coarser, there are only few grains through the wall thickness, and the degree of deviation is, uh, is almost 90, uh, 90 degrees from the axial direction. Uh, okay, so these are the kind of microstructures that we can produce with this flow forming or uh, twisted extrusion process. And then we will see, as compared with the uh, extruded or traditional uh, PN2000, how has been improved in hoop stress the, uh, the creep, uh, creep uh, resistance. And you can see how when the grain is coarser and also the degree of deviation from the axial direction is, is higher, the uh, creep life has improved so much, even reaching for that kind of product the, uh, the expected values that we were thinking about at the beginning. Uh, we tested that in a quite novel way too, which is uh, that you take one part of the tube and then you fabricate two uh, alumina uh, devices like these ones here, and then you pull apart them and then you get the, the results. So, uh, okay, that seems some success, but Anyway, it's not the only success in a pressurized tube because you know you have the tube, but you have a cap in the bottom of the tube, and you have to weld the cap uh, uh, on the tube because they have to be pressurized. And the welding has to work as good as the tube uh, in order to get success in these kind of uh, of materials. So, welding these materials is not very is not is not is not nice because any technique involving fusion, uh, fusion process so they lead to coarsening of oxide particles. And this coarsening is not good because of the detrimental effect on mechanical properties. But uh, there are other alternative techniques like the solid state techniques or the fusion welding, uh, which, uh, tank, uh, which are good because they is not involving uh, the, um, uh, fusion, but they are very sluggish and they take very big cost uh, to, to be developed. Then we went to another one, which is the friction welding. So I don't know if you are familiar with that, but friction welding works when you take the two parts of the tube and then uh, you start to rotate one part very, very fast, and then uh, you put close together, and then one uh, of the parts is uh, friction with the other one until the material actually melts. And when uh, this happened, and then, then you 
push very hard both parts of the tube and then all of the melt material which is the bad material because of the coarsening thin is falling apart and then you can see here and the material is actually weld but however we found some uh, voids or we call the lamination because this is our recrystallized grains and uh, we mm, found some uh, voids that they are not good for the mechanical properties when they are in service and actually we found other problems so after recrystallization heat treatment that you can see how the grains are following the uh, deformation of, of the in the in the unrecrystallized matrix we found some areas here which cannot be recrystallized and this is uh, maybe because of the, 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 uh, the because of the, the the force applied during the uh, friction welding process or to be honest, I don't know why they cannot be recrystallized. But this will put us in trouble when the, te the, the tubes are tested, as you can see here. Because, uh, okay, we test, uh, we test this, and we test uh, the, the, um, the material without welding, and when we put the cap, so the properties are going down. So we have to still uh, work in uh, how to improve this process until uh, we get the better results. So, uh, so any idea that you can suggest to us so it would be very welcome because uh, as I told you before, we are not full uh, dedicated to this kind of research, but I am sure that we can be very rich if we success in that. Uh, other topic that I would like to talk is about the recrystallization on, on this kind of, of materials. So, as I told you before, we, uh, our initial microstructure that we obtained here by traditional uh, scanning electron microscopy using a channeling contrast te uh, technique, you can see the scale of the grains uh, is quite fine. Uh, even using EBSD, you can uh, define quite well the grains. And uh, in this histogram here, you can see that the average is between 1 and 2 microns in size. So this is a pretty small grain. So there are so many uh, steel projects dealing with this ultra fine grain, how to reach these ultra fine grains that which in our case is the starting microstructure, not the final microstructure that we want to get. And uh, also these grains we also measure because there are several people uh, arguing about how is the uh, grain boundary uh, or between these grains. We measure the, uh, the misorientation between grains and we can see that the angle is uh, pretty, we can consider as a high angle boundary too. Uh, so the thing is, okay, we know the starting microstructure, we will perform a heat treatment, let's uh, focus on the temperature here. Uh, this is 1400 degrees C. This alloy melts at 1482 degrees. So it's about 0.9 the melting temperature. Until that temperature, the material doesn't recrystallize. So if uh, but if we increase the deformation level uh, during the flow forming process, we see a kind of U shape uh, curve from the recrystallization point of view. But also we see that there's big difference uh, between the uh, recrystallization in the inner part of the tube and in the outer, especially here, that there is no very difference with this temperature for the inner part, but it's a big decrease, or let's say 600 degrees, for the start of recrystallization in the outer part of the tube. So we have to try to explain why this kind of difference in a, let's say, 1.2 thickness tube. So if we see this in light optical microscopy with a polarized light, you can see some patterns here that can be due to the, 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 the rules during the extrusion plus torsion process. And you can see these patterns is not going to the center of the tube, I mean to the inner part of the tube. It's stopping at the middle. I remind you that it, during the hot extrusion, uh, or sorry, uh, the flow uh, forming process uh, with the three cylinders or the torsion twisted process, the, the, um, the preform to be uh, uh, twisted torsion is a uh, hold in a mandrel. So that means that this mandrel can support the inner part of the tube not to be collapsed during the process. So that means that maybe mm, the deformation is not uh, going uh, to the uh, to homogeneously 
through the wall thickness of the tube. And if you can see that recrystallization start to happen just in this area, you know, between uh, these uh, patterns appears, not the center part of the tube, which is without any pattern. If we know, if we go now for the 90% deformed tube, you can see that the pattern is homogeneously distributed through the wall thickness of the tube. And also the temperature between the inner and outer parts are becoming almost the same. The microstructure then starts to recrystallize in coarser grains but in the, cent but in the center part of, of the tube. So it's, it's clear that there should be a relationship between the deformation and the recrystallization in these materials too. So let's go for uh, and, and make some uh, bent tests. So when I was there in Cambridge, so Harry suggests why you don't perform a bent test and then uh, let's analyze both together. The uh, tension, uh, what is going on in a tension test and in also in a compression. You can analyze this in the same kind of test and also see what happened in the neutral axis, you know, in the neutral axis of this bent test there is no recrystallization. So it's clear that also there is a gradient of the, in the grain shape between the neutral axis which re, means the formation is lower going to the compression or the tension areas with the grains are very very small. So it's, cle it's clear that a gradient of deformation can promote the uh, nucleation of recrystallization. This is one topic to be uh, discussed this afternoon. And uh, he, uh, Harry suggests also to me to analyze one theory uh, that he proposed and in order to uh, really um, take into account and try to clarify I, and put in different situations in order, uh, if, in order to see if this theory is true or not. So he suggests, oops, he suggests that if we are working with a grain size of let's say 10 microns in size when recrystallization starts, I mean when the boundary perturbation starts to, uh, to grow uh, during recrystallization process, so this boundary is normally very away or far away from the pinning points of, of, uh, of the grain size. But when you are working with a one micron uh, diameter grain size, so the, the grain boundary junctions itself acts at severe uh, pinning points. And then you have to increase the temperature so much in order to produce this perturbation and then recrystallization start. This also can explain why you have to increase so much the temperature for recrystallization in these kind of materials. But also can explain other, uh, other features that we observe is that if we introduce a deformation gradient in our material, we can uh, force that some grains uh, are coarser than others. That maybe these coarse grains are easier for recrystallization than the smallest one. And then this can drop the recrystallization temperature as actually happens. Uh, this theory uh, is in contrast other theories that say that the, this recrystallization process in a material with 0.5 yttria particles in solid solution uh, can um, also uh, be re um, these particles can uh, can affect so much recrystallization process. But you know this um, this theory cannot explain. Uh, if uh, why introducing a deformation gradient at very low temperatures, this recrystallization temperature can be affected because they know the particles are there. The particles should uh, still um, um, affect in the, uh, the recrystallization. So let's put this theory in a compromise. Uh, trying to uh, answer some uh, features that we observe in the tubes. So as I told you at the beginning, uh, one of the features of the tube is to produce an alumina scale uh, during the, um, or like we, uh, we call a pre-oxidizing heat treatment uh, to protect the tube or to protect the material from corrosion. And as you know, there is a, mm, it's well known that between the layer of, oops, the layer of alumina here, which is, uh, if you see from a flat uh, view, is like that. Uh, there is some stresses between the layer and the uh, matrix, the iron matrix, when the alumina layer grows. And one of these stresses, uh, or due to these stresses, we observe that there is some grains, 
here, very coarse, very recrystal. I mean, there are recrystallized grains as compared with the center of the of the of the matrix. So, again, when you have stresses here, recrystallization is becoming easier. If you go to the EBSD, you also you can see the coarse grain, recrystallized grain, uh, grains here, but but. I, but also you can see other important features that were suggested in previous work by Cho and Badisha and also Regle and other uh, people from uh, University of Paris. Uh, they observe that mm, when the grain or the previous grains are more prone to the 111 texture and you can see in blue color here, recrystallization is easier. And you can see that in the center of the tube, or so, uh, far away from the surface, the uh, population of 111 grains are not as populated than here. So uh, it's not, uh, you know, this both process are affecting the growth of the recrystallized grains. Okay, so uh, we uh, were uh, discussing some of the features that we observe on uh, nucleation of the recrystallized grains, but now we have to see what is happening when these, grain, these grains are nucleated and then have to grow. And uh, to do that, we observe with TM how strong is the dis uh, dispersion of the yttria particles, yttria particles that we observe uh, or we put into the in, in the material in the beginning, and you can see there is a very strong uh, distribution of, of particles that are very uh, strong alignment aligned with the extrusion direction. Then, when you uh, <coughs> uh, heat it up, the material and recrystallize. This produce a very long and very coarse grain. Uh, I mean, very align uh, strong aligned aligned grains in the extrusion direction, like you can see here. Uh, so uh, let me show, show you uh, a picture because we were able to measure in this material uh, the uh, grain growth uh, in the uh, axial, also in the transverse direction. Just this, uh, I mean, these pictures have been taken in one hour. It's one hour. I mean, each uh, of the these pictures is taken uh, one hour. Uh, difference between them, right? And then, because of this is one grain only, it's growing in a matrix of uh, very fine grains. You can just only measure this displacement. You can figure out more or less how is going the velocity of the grain growth uh, in the uh, uh, transverse direction of the tube. You can do, do something also in the longitudinal direction. And you know, there is a very big difference in the uh, velocity that we, c we observe. And we came up with one idea uh, to try to model or to explain how recrystallization in these materials are. You know, they, uh, some grain is nucleated here, and if we consider the particles that they are uh, forming these kind of layers, the grain is easier to grow in that direction where there are no particles, but it's difficult growing in that direction where they, are there, uh, they have to uh, avoid the pinning effect of these particles. So in that sense, we will get a grain with some kind of ledge forming during the growth. So it's a kind of ledge mechanism for the grain growth here. And of course, the growth in that direction should be uh, much lower than in the other one than that was that we previously observed. And you can see in that picture some of the ledge that we observed. So uh, we consider only the thinner pinning, uh, pinning effect on the, uh, on, on, the part, uh, on the on the equation to describe the velocity and then to get a value of the mobility of the grain boundary. This mobility is not sensitive to the direction uh, that you are measured. So this uh, we got uh, the same. Uh, I mean, we got a, uh, a value of uh, around uh, 345 kilojoules per mole, which is far away or far more than that 240 uh, uh, kilojoules per mole, which is the uh, iron cell diffusion in alpha ferrite. You know, but we are talking about the 1300 degrees C where the ferrite is, should be in the delta ferrite form. And then, uh, if you take into account this value, then the uh, results are pretty close. And the things that we are want to do in the future is try to get models of this kind, or try to analyze by modeling this kind of grain growth. 
So uh, we uh, were here, I present some results obtained by Miodon Miodonic uh, in aluminum alloys using this kind of modeling, the Q-Pots modeling. And then you can uh, figure out how the, mod uh, how the grains are growing and we can start to play with, it, with them in order to see if uh, we can uh, obtain a new uh, patterns uh, of recrystalliza uh, recrystallization grains because okay they um, they are several uh, models also to apply to when you have to to play with a uh, lot amount of atoms like monte carlo and uh, cellular automata so we want to start to play with this kind of modeling and uh, and we'll see and finally the other topic that i would like to to share with you that we are working now with these materials is that spinoidal decomposition in that in in these materials so uh, spinoid um, Let's uh, well. I, I I am sure that you know uh, pretty well the thermodynamics behind this kind of, of transformation. But uh, let me let me summarize this uh, very fast. So um, uh, if uh, okay, so if you have a um, the, I mean this is the free energy of a mixture. Let's say A B mixture, and then uh, <coughs> if you, when you get uh, a, a certain temperature, a free mixture when two minima. Uh, there, there will be uh, a, an area, which is this one between A and D, that uh, you can decompose uh, your mixture into regions, a uh, A rich region and a B rich region. So, and when you do that, then there is a decrease in the free energy. So, uh, because you have a maximum, and also you have two minima, there is some inf uh, inflection points here that describe a so an area here with temperature where uh, the material can be decomposed by a uh, homogeneous solution uh, when it's cooling down in that region uh, become unstable with or to infinitesimal perturbation in the chemical composition and this infinitesimal perturbation will grow to form an A and B rich uh, regions. So, uh, as we can consider in principle that the diffusion goes also to this uh, to minimize the free energy, uh, then uh, we can consider both flux and diffusion in the following way. Uh, if we describe the flux of atoms uh, from one, in one direction uh, as a function of the gradient of the concentration, and the diffusion is function of the uh, I mean the, uh, the the gradient uh, uh, or the, the change of the free energy with concentration, we can consider two situations. The first one, with this, uh, the diffusion coefficient is positive, and the chemical potential gradient. Uh, I mean, uh, with this situation happens, the diffusion coefficient is positive, and then is going in the same direction that the concentration gradient. But when this situation happens the diffusion uh, coefficient is negative and the diffusion will occur against the concentration gradient and when uh, when we are talking between the maximum and the two inflection points i mean when we are in the spinoidal area we are in this situation in situation two that means that the diffusion occurs from the richer zone uh, from the poor zones to the richer zones this is the uphill diffusion and then this can explain why uh, okay, we got this kind of, of diffusion here. So we start from a, a small perturbation and then it's growing up and uh, is forming two separate regions, A and B, which is different than the precipitation process that is happening when you are in that area here. Uh, because in that case, you get uh, okay. You will get a first uh, with uh, nucleation process, and then you will get a precipitate which reach the uh, equilibrium concentration all the time, and there will be a depletion of concentration around the precipitate. Okay, so taking these two things into account, we will analyze uh, the spinoidal, which, as you know, is also called that some embridgement uh, from the old times. I mean, when the people start to study the, uh, the stainless steel with iron, very rich in chromium, they discovered that at 475 degrees, there is an increase in hardness. They call this the embridgement, uh, 475 embridgement. And of course, uh, this embridgement happened in that material too, as I uh, show you here. But we need to 
characterize this. And the, uh, the, mm, the best way to do is going to the uh, electro, uh, I mean to the 3D atom proof technique. Okay, it's like the same technique that uh, uh, Dr. Caballero showed you before. And I will go very, uh, very, very rapidly uh, around some of the principle of this technique and how it's working. Okay, when you get your material, you can to mechanize a sample, a very, uh, I mean, a, a, a sample with a needle form with a very, very t uh, tiny tip. Let's say less than 20 nanometers in the tip. Mm, to produce a sample here uh, like that. It's a very, very hard work. You, ho you need to, to pass several uh, electropolicing states, and then you, uh, when you finally get the sample. And then, oops, when you got the sample, uh, then uh, you, uh, you place in the microscope, or, which is uh, like that, and uh, then uh, you cl uh, put close to the detector. So you use a lip which is the local electrode atom proof. LIP is a trademark for this kind of detector. And this tr uh, detector, uh, we were told by in Oak Ridge by Dr. Miller, which is actually building this equipment, uh, we told that it's more reliable uh, controlling uh, the, uh, the, um, the um, electric field which is produced between the detector uh, and that sample when you apply some uh, pulse, I mean when you, uh, you, you apply a an, an, uh, different voltage between the sample and the detector. And then uh, when, uh, when this happens, some of the atoms on the tip are ionized and going to the detector. And you can control exactly the atoms that are going up from here to the detector because you can control this electric field. And then you evaporize the atoms from the, from the needle layer by layer and then you can get the uh, time of flight information to the detector which can give you uh, the ratio between the mass of the ion and the charge of the ion which is like a trademark for each atom so you know exactly the atom that you are detecting here and also because of the time of flight you can also place the atom in the proper position the previous position in the needle so you can reconstruct your needle with the ionized atom that you detected here okay and this is the things okay these things is not easy you have to have a software to uh, translate all the information obtained by this time of flight mass spectroscopy uh, to some patterns like looks like a some modeling that you saw previously Okay, this is the needle, to reconstruct needle, uh, uh, and plot here the uh, iron atoms, which is almost full of iron, of course, and also chromium. Uh, this corresponds to uh, an age of 475 for 10 hours, so there is no difference. Uh, the chromium is homogeneously distributed into the iron matrix too. But when you go to 2,000 hours, you can see there are some areas where the chromium is uh, segregated, I mean, where the chromium is concentrated. And this is the spinoidal. Uh, notice the volume that we are talking about. So it's 30 nanometers per 30 nanometers uh, times uh, 127 nanometers in length. So can you imagine the size of this? So there is no other way to uh, get an experimental uh, or, uh, image of that because you know the uh, structure here with the chromium rich is the same that chromium lean. So you cannot go to TEM to get a pattern because the TEM is based on the crystallographic uh, uh, contrast. And you get the same cell here than here. So there are no other way to do this kind of, of, of the composition that this atom proof. You can plot also the uh, isoconcentration uh, surface, which means that uh, in, the, in these uh, areas at least you have 20% chromium, but you will get uh, richer areas of chromium inside this, this surface, okay? So the thing is, uh, okay, we know, uh, we observe the spinoidal, but now we want to quantify the spinoidal. So mm, we go to the kahn hiller cook equation, we describe the spinoidal composition, very complicated, uh, but uh, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it's like kind of sinusoidal perturbation. We, you have an amplitude, which is the differing composition between the rich and poor zones, and also you have uh, the wavelength, which is the separation between the rich and the poor zone of chromium. You can summarize more or less like here, 
which is actually the Fourier transform of the data obtained uh, by the 3D atom proof. So you can manage uh, to get uh, information about the wavelength and also the amplitude. And when you go for that, you get some results like this one. And okay, uh, all of the information about how to transfer all the, or how to process all the data that you got from the 3D atom proof to this kind of uh, statistical distributions is here in that paper are due to the Miller, Langer, Hetherington, uh, Cerezo, Smith and Elliot in the three parts ACTA paper from 95. And then uh, following this paper that uh, they conclude that um, you can see that you have a spinoidal when the, you know the, this dotted line means the real distribution of atoms that you have is far away from the binomial distribution. I mean the two maxima are not coincident. And then when that happened, the best uh, distribution uh, to analyze the amplitude is the LBM uh, distribution, which is this one. Okay, which is the Langer, Baron, and Miller uh, distribution. And it is pretty easy because the difference between the maximum R is the amplitude of the your spinoidal. In that case, uh, we got to maximum, uh, this is in atomic percent, in weight percent is 45.8 and 3.2 uh, percent. So we have an amplitude of 42.6 uh, uh, percent. And also, uh, from the autocorrelation fun uh, function from the data that I showed you uh, previously, we can uh, obtain information about the thickness of the uh, spinoidally decomposed areas and also the wavelength, I mean the distance between these chromium rich areas. And in that case, we got this information for 2,000 hours, which is the wavelength is around 12 nanometers, and each feature has more or less a diameter of 7.5. Uh, nanometers. If you plot uh, these measurements obtained at different uh, different times at that temperature, you can get more or less a, a result like that for the amplitude, and you can see that the amplitude is increasing, increasing, and increasing with time. And the same, of, of course, with the wavelength. So this is one way to describe the kinetics of the spinoidal experimentally. But uh, we also uh, can check if we already have a spinoidal composition in that material in PM2000 because according with the phase diagrams, we are very, very pretty close to the spinoidal, uh, spinoidal boundary. But if we analyze this with time, we see that the peak of concentration uh, inside this isoconcentration surface is growing with the time. It's not the maximum is not constant with time, which means you don't have precipitate. You already have a spinoidal uh, decomposition there. Okay, but uh, to do to the uh, to do three D atom proof is quite complicated because it's a very expensive equipment. But it's very hard to prepare uh, the um, the samples. Uh, we were thinking about to use other technique that is the thermoelectrical power, uh, trying to measure uh, if we can track the kinetics of the spinoidal. Uh, we, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the thermoelectrical power, uh, but it's based on the Sebeck, on the Sebeck effect when you place a sample between two reference blocks uh, which have uh, a, a temperature gradient between them, you got uh, a different voltage. And the ratio of this voltage and this gradient is what we call the thermoelectrical or TEP value, which is measured more or less in microvolts per Kelvin. Uh, this step value uh, is function of the uh, plastic deformation. Uh, I mean, when you recover the material, I mean that this location has disappeared in the material, they didn't increase in the tap. But when you have work hardening, uh, there is a decrease in tap. But also with the precipitation process. But when you reduce the elements in solid solution, there is an increase in tap. But when you uh, dissolve the material, there is a reduction in tap. This variation in the tab uh, with a reference, uh, that's the thing that we uh, can track with this kind of equipment. And here you can see how as compared with this state, this, uh, well, the, the as received state it will be the reference, and uh, comparing with this state you can see how is obtaining an increase on thermoelectrical power uh, when the spinoidal is taking place. And we are sure that it's taking place because we observed previously in 3D atom proof. 
And finally, so what is the effect of this spinoidal on mechanical properties? It's something also that we are interested because, you know, we, um, uh, uh, we also, say, uh, uh, also tell you that uh, this material can be applied for bio, uh, as a biomaterial. And if you want to create an uh, alumina layer, you have to heat it up until 500 degrees C. And then it's the, the temperature at which the spinoidal is taking place. So maybe this can affect also the mechanical properties in some way. Of course, because the embrittlement thing, there is an increase on GL strength and also on tensile strength and a subsequent dec uh, decrease in elongation and reduction in area. But the amaze me is that how it's behaving during the uh, tensile test. I mean, these two correspond to the material without in a, a spinoidal decomposition treatment, and this which has been spinoidally decomposed. And you know, there is a decrease in, in elongation and also a decrease in, in, in ductility, but they still show some ductility uh, during uh, the, 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 the mechanical testing. And this is different in that material that we observe, for example, in MA956 or other uh, material which are very similar to that. Okay, so this is also interesting. And of course, it's interesting how uh, this material also can behave uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, I mean, can behave during the fatigue uh, test. You can see that surprisingly, when you uh, decompose uh, the material, there is an increase uh, on the on 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 the uh, on the stress uh, amplitude during the fatigue test. So this seems to present a better fatigue properties with the uh, with um, with uh, spinoidal decomposition uh, taking place. So at the moment, there are uh, some other colleagues who are here trying to explain why this is happening and they, so they observe also some kind of uh, this, this uh, pilot of these locations in the spinoidally decomposed uh, areas of the dislocations and then uh, can uh, be uh, the fatigue uh, properties can be affected by that, by that but this is something that we have to still working on that and finally uh, I would like to show you something that I found in the, uh, the phase transformation group page in Cambridge, which corresponds to some work made by uh, oops, made by uh, Professor Saito from Waseda University in Japan uh, around uh, about the modeling of the uh, spinoidal decomposition process. Um, they apply the Kahn Hiller equations. I mean, the uh, they apply some phase field modeling uh, to. Uh, uh, to, to analyze the decomposition, uh, the spinoidal decomposition in alloy, which is a um, very similar, or it's not uh, as chromium, at, uh, the as higher chromium that we have, but at the end it's an iron chromium alloy, and uh, they describe pretty well of the uh, decomposition process. Here is the time running in hours, so can you uh, figure out how is the, uh, the, the speed of the decomposition. You can obtain this uh, from the uh, web page in, in Cambridge, not so far from the post-tech modeling group. So this is something that you have to improve. But that's, uh, I think that can be all the information and I can, I can show you now about this material. So thank you very much for your attention.